Hi all, this is Thomas from Nettime Logic, and in this video I will show you how you can do a modification of the FPGA design for the time card. Before we start with the modification, I have to give you a short introduction what modification I will do later on. For this reason, we will go into the folder FPJ, Open Source, Implementation, Time Card. If we scroll down here, we see already a block type. The blocks here in the block diagram are later on also reflected as IP cores in the block diagram of Vivado. The modification which I would like to do today is to add an additional TOD slave, the time of day slave, which is able to set the time of the adjustable clock. The TOD slave has the main job to parse the messages which are received from a GNSS receiver. On one, hand, on one hand, these are the time of day information, but there are also some statistics available like a number of satellites, uh, spoofing status and stuff like that, which you can later on read out via the AXI light interface. So for the GNSS1, we have different options. There is a connection which is going to an OxyUART connector here, where you can read out the information directly via the host PC. The RX path of the GNSS1 receiver is also going directly to the TOD slave. Additionally, you have the option to map the input path for, uh, of the GNSS receiver also to an antenna connector. The GNSS2 receiver, which is on some time cards as well available, so you have the option to have a second receiver on the time card, we have simply just instantiate AXI UART. So there have, you have only the option to read out this information directly via the host PC. The option is also there to do some mapping to an antenna connector, so you would have the option to forward messages uh, to another connector. Now what I will do later on is to add a second TOD slave which receives the UART messages from the GNSS2 receiver and does directly parsing of the messages directly in the FPGA. So later on we will be able to read out all the status information directly on the host PC. So we have not to do any message parsing on the host. The parsing is fully done in the additional TOD slave which we will add later on. And this simplifies a lot the usage of an additional uh, receiver. So as a next step, we will go to Ivado and open the already existing project. So in our next step, we will open the already existing time code FPGA design, which we have built from scratch with the create project table script. This takes now again a couple of seconds, but since we have already recreated it from the tickle script, it takes much less time uh, compared to the creation from scratch. Okay, here we are already. And as a first step, I will show you on the tools, settings, where our repository is located. Here, IP repository, you will see that we have already added the open source folder as our IP repository. This is done automatically by the script, but it's an important part because this folder is used for scanning for IPI components. Especially the, the custom IP components are stored here, the Xilinx IPI components are not stored here, they are uh, part of the tool. Good, as a next step, we can open the block diagram. After a couple of seconds, the block diagram should be open. To give you a first idea about the block diagram, I will show you the same path which I was showing you already in the figure on GitHub. So we will search now for the GNSS 1 RX path. So here we have the signal input GNSS 1 RX and we can mark this line and it gets highlighted so it's a bit easier to visualize where it's connected. So the first connection goes to the OxyUART interface adapter. 
This one is, as I already mentioned earlier, directly connected to the host PC. So in the FPGA, we are doing no special things with them. Uh, the driver can access to the UART interface and read directly the messages that are coming in here. Additionally, the signal goes to the SMA selector. The idea of that is that you could forward the Oryx path of the GNSS1 directly to an SMA output. So you would be able to forward GNSS information to somewhere else. Uh, then the line also goes a bit above here to our TOD slave. Here we have only the Oryx path because the TX path to write something to the Genesis receiver is not interesting for us. Here you can see the instance. Uh, it's connected uh, to AXI. Uh, it has a time input, uh, it has a clock input, reset input, the data of the receiver and it sends out also time adjustments. Good. Now we will go also to have a look into the GNSS 2 Rx path. This one was also somewhere here below. So here we have it. Uh, you are GNSS 2 Rx. We can mark the signal here as well. Uh, and as we can see, it goes only to a Oxy UART interface. And it goes as well to the SMA selector, so we would have also the option to forward it to somewhere else. But as you can see, there is no connection to a DOD slave. So as a next step, we will add an additional TOD slave. You can simply click on the plus here to add any IP core to our block design. This shows us directly the whole catalog of supported IP cores for our target device, which is in our case an Arctic 7 device. If I type in here TC for time card on the line, I will see directly all the time card specific IP cores, like the adjustable clock, like a frequency counter, signal generator, signal timestampers, and as well as the TOD slave. This is the one which we would like to add. So simply double click on that one, and this will add directly a new block to our block design. To make it a bit easier to get the connectivity of this block, I will move it to the other TOD slave. So I just select it and move it to the other one. Okay. As you can see now here, this block has no connections uh, right now, so we have to make them all manually. There is also an option to do the automatic connection, but I don't like this approach because then you're never sure if it does the correct uh, thing. Good, let's start with the simple ones. So a simple one is, for example, the time input. We would like to have simply time from our adjustable clock as a source of our time input. So simply make a connection with time input. The clock you would like have, uh, to have as well, the same as the other TLD slave, so take this one. Reset, you can also take the same one. And now it comes a bit to the more specific one, like the UR uh, RX input from the second GNSS receiver. So we zoom a bit out here and go to our second GNSS receiver signal, which is the one here. So I can also take here the drawing tool and make just a line to my Oryx UR data input of the TLD slave phone. Just for sanity check, I will quickly have a look. Uh, okay, yeah, it's the correct one. It's already the one which is connected here to the second uh, Oxy UR adapter. Good. Then we have now two connections remaining. Um, one, one is uh, the, the time adjustment output. The idea of that one is really to adjust our adjustable clock, so we can quickly double check. Okay, the TOD slave goes here to a time adjustment, since this is one of our input time sources. Uh, we can now make as well a connection to the time adjustment to input, but we will not really use that, because th that would mean that we also need an offset and drift adjustment to correctly adjust the adjustable clock. And this is done by a PPS slave, which we will not connect now in this tutorial. But uh, yeah, you would have here additional inputs, and then you could later on select a specific source. What is now remaining is the AXI slave. 
The AXS Lathe is the one, the one, the registers which are connectable via the host PC. So we will quickly check as well on the TFS Lathe zero where it goes. Okay, it goes here to this interconnect time card. Uh, we have to add here an additional master interface to connect the TFS Lathe here. Simply double click on this module. And then you see already the parameters which can be adjusted. And we would like to have one additional more master interface. So instead of 24, we would like to have 25. Simply click on OK. And it will directly add an additional output here. Perfect. So we can simply drag and connect this one here as well. OK. And now the interconnect got also some new clock and reset input. The clock is quite easy to connect. It should be the same as our slave. So we simply make the connection from this clock to the same one as our TOD slave has. And then only the reset is remaining. The reset we don't take the same one. Because that's a bit different story how it should be ideally done. Uh, we quickly check where it comes from, from the TOD slave. So here we have a processor reset system. This one has a peripheral output and an interconnect output. The peripheral output reset is used for our slave. But for the interconnect, we should use really the interconnect reset. This has some kind of different timing when it comes to reset and it just guarantees that everything is working properly. So we can simply connect the reset as well to this interconnect reset. Good. Now we have done all the required connection. As a next step, we have to do the configuration of the TOD slave. If I double click on the TOD slave, you can see the configurable parameters. Most of them are already correct. So we have a period of 20 nanoseconds since we are running uh, from a 50 MHz clock. Uh, these parameters have to be both set, but the default pull rate we have maybe to adjust. In our case, it's usually uh, 19200 bits per second. So I will simply set that as the default pull rate, so it should be directly running correctly. If I've done that, I can click on OK. And then my first step uh, with interconnecting the new module is already done. As a next step, we can go to the address editor. Here in the address editor, we can see now all the assigned addresses for our AXI slaves. Before I start with any modification here, I would like to show you some more information in GitHub. Let's go back to Git and first have a look into the block diagram. In the address editor, we will see as well two kinds of masters. So one is our configuration master, which does initial configuration of some of the IP cores. But the configuration master has also access to the full other space of all AXI slaves here. So theoretically, you can write every register you would like to write on one of these IP cores. Second one is the OXY PCI Express bridge, which goes also to memory mapped access via AXI and allows the access to our cores from the host PC. So these two masters are existing in our system. Let's scroll a bit up to the overview again and let's jump to the address one here. So here we have also defined all the used addresses for all the instantiated IP cores. Um, we have started a bit uh, with different uh, allocation of the addresses and we have now to find a free address space where we could place our new added TOD slave. So let's go back to Ivado and our address editor there. So as you can see now, here is a TOD slave, which has not an assigned address. Uh, to make it a bit easier, I will uh, sort it now by the offset address. Okay, that makes it much easier. And we would like to have it somewhere where is free space. Um, I guess between timestamp 4 and frequency counter 1, we have, for example, some free space. So now what we can do is right click on the TOD slave and say assign address. This has now assigned any random address, so we have to modify it manually first. Uh, I can just click it in here and start typing, so 0113 
is the one which I would like to use as base address. Um, yeah, perfect. It was jumping directly into the correct location. Uh, now we have assigned it for the conf master. We have to do the same for the oxy PCIe master. And here you can see the other is still the old one. But there is a shortcut uh, by right click here and say copy it to other master. And this directly copies the address to the other master, so we will have it now here on the same location. And this is really quite important to have the same address mapping on all of the masters, otherwise you will mess up your system. Good, then we can go back to the diagram and execute directly a first validation. This validation does a basic check of the whole design, which we have done in uh, the block design, as well in the address editor. So we would recognize if there is something completely wrong with the mapping, if we have unmapped slaves, if we have made something completely wrong with the connection in the block diagram. But as you can see here now, the validation was successful and we can click here on OK and continue now with the next step, which are required for our design adaptations. In the next step, I will show you two additional files which are most probably also affected when you are doing changes in the block diagram. This is the core list file and the default config file. These files are also located directly in the time code folder where you also find the create project echo. In chapter 6 and 7, these two modules are described. Let's go quickly to the default configuration. The default configuration is done by the configuration master. The configuration master is directly started after the reset of the FPGA is released. This allows to enable directly a module, for example. So this module allows commands to write, to wait, or to, to read also registers directly inside the FPGA before any interaction with the software is required. So by default, you can directly enable some uh, modules or whatever. Second one is the core list. The core list contains all modules which are part of the block design and accessible via AXI. This was a, would allow to make a very modular driver. So the driver could go through the core list, check which module is available and load the driver accordingly. So if you would add an additional timestamp or in our case an additional TOD slave, the software could directly detect that from the core list and load an additional driver module accordingly. We will go now to our local repository to modify these files. So here we are again in implementation Xilinx time card. Let's start with the default config file. So the default config file contains now already some commands. Command is always built up with the command, the first part of it. Here we can skip, wait, read or write. Then we have the base address. In our case here the base address of the adjustable clock. Then we have a register address, address 0 here in our case of the adjustable clock. And then a data field. This can be data or time in case of the wait. For the TOD slave we have here already an example. We are doing a write command. Of the to the base address to register 8 we are writing the polarity so we are setting polarity to 1 and later on we enable it directly and then we are waiting a couple of seconds until we go to the next command. So what we do now is just simply copying this TOD slave commands and we do exactly the same for our second TOD slave so I put in here a number. Now we have also to adopt here the address to the one which we have defined in our address editor. And we just enable the TOD slave as well and change the polarity accordingly. If you need some more information about this register set, you will find all that stuff inside the Git repo repository. There are all readme files where every, every register is described. Good, we can save now this default config file and in the next step we go to the core list file. The core list file has here a definition of all available cores. These are the time core specific ones and then we have here also some uh, exciting specific ones. Uh, now we have to add an additional TOD slave. So uh, the, the 
core type number C we have to add in a second instance. Uh, here you can also see how the structure of these commands or the, the lines here is. What we do now is also going to the chili slave, which is the one here. Uh, we simply copy that line, paste it in. Now we say to the second one, this is instance number one, because zero we have already for the initial one. I put it also a, one, a zero and a one in. Um, then the version number is the same. The base address is different, so I have to change it to the correct one. The high range of the base address as well, of course. Uh, and the other ones we can keep as they are, so uh, no interrupt and sensitivity is required. So this, that's basically already everything which is required on the core list. And now when we start the synthesis, the new core list is directly considered as well as the default configuration. And that's already basically everything which you have to adopt in addition to have a complete cleaned up design after a modification on the block diagram. So now we can go back to Rivado and start the implementation. In Vivado, you can now simply go to Tools, run Tickle Script, and we can simply call again the Create Binaries All Tickle Script. This will create for us a complete new golden image and a new update image. So let's call this script and wait a couple of minutes until the run is over, and then I will be back. The implementation run has now successfully finished. As a next step, we could now program the time code. But this step we will skip since there is a complete own tutorial how to program the time code. After programming the time code, you would have now access to the newly added TOD slave. So via the AXI register set, you could access all the available registers of this new added TOD slave. As a next step, I would like to show you now how you can store your changes which you have made in the BD. This is also very helpful because maybe you are interested to store these changes also in your version control tool. So as a next step, we go to our local repository folder. There we will go into the BD folder and here we have our original BD tickle. This is now unchanged. So I will copy now the path of this time code BD tickle with clicking on shift, right click, and then copy the path. Afterwards, we can go to the tickle console. I paste in here the copied path, remove these uh, marks here, and then I start writing here, write BD tickle. And then I select the write BD and push the enter key. This makes the path directly with the correct direction of the slashes, so that is very nice that you have not to change them manually. Now we need some additional options like the force, since there is already a file, so we would like to overwrite it. And we also need the option no IP. This means that we will be compatible also with newer Rivado version, so it makes it easier to upgrade for newer Rivado version. Now I can simply Execute this command and it will all write directly my BD tickle. As you can see, we have now changes here on the BD tickle. Now, to get a short overview, I will quickly show you also the diff view. And you will see there are only a couple of files affected which we have to add again to our version control system. So, this is mainly the BD tickle, which you can see here. Then the two text files, which are uh, have the core list in and the full configuration, which is executed by the conf master. And then, of course, we have all the required binary products, which you would like uh, to store as well, maybe in our version control system. And these are then needed also to program our time code. So, yeah, this was it from our tutorial, how to modify the block design of the time code. So add additional features, add additional timestamps and stuff like that works exactly identically. And I hope you have learned now how easy you can do modification. And I wish you now a lot of fun to do any modification you like on the time code PT design. Have a nice evening and see you soon.